In this video, I just want to talk about an example exploratory analysis, just to show kind of the, the tools that you might want to use when you're just starting out looking at data. Um, so a lot of these things are basic, you know, things that we've covered, like, you know, one-dimensional plots, two-dimensional plots, basic summaries, exploratory plots, just to get a sense of what the data look like uh, and what you might be able to do with them. Now, the first thing, of course, um, anytime you look, you start to look at data, um, is, you, is you have to have a kind of a basic um, idea in mind of what you're looking for. Uh, this can come in the form of a hypothesis, or even more generally, just as a basic question, you know, what are you trying to answer with this data set? Um, so the data set that I'm going to use right now for this example comes from the, Envi the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, um, and it involves air pollution monitoring data uh, from the United States. Uh, in particular, um, we're looking at fine particulate matter uh, air pollution uh, that's in the air. So particulate matter is just a fancy word for dust. So this is just dust that's in the air. Um, and it's, uh, it's, of, it's of concern because we inhale air all the time. Uh, and along with the air, we inhale the dust. And it may have certain health effects on populations. Um, so one of the important p uh, pieces of legislation in the last uh, four decades in the United States has been the Clean Air Act. And the Clean Air Act uh, has been designed to reduce the levels of air pollution uh, in, in the United States. And so one of the questions that you might want to ask um, when it comes to these kinds of data is, are air pollution le levels lower uh, now than they were before? Right? So it's a very basic question. It's fairly general. We can, we can look at it in a variety of different ways. And so we're going to look at it in a very specific way. We're going to look at uh, a fine particle air pollution. Uh, and so this fine particle air pollution was, was started being measured in 1999 um, and it's currently being measured today. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at data from 1999 and, and look at uh, the fairly recent data from 2012. And we want to answer the very basic question, ha are the levels on average lower in 2012 uh, than they were in 1999? Um, and so the nice thing about uh, air pollution data in the United States is that the EPA uh, collects all of this data um, and makes it essentially all available on their website. So it's freely available. I'll put the URL up on the website. Um, and, and you can download as much or as little as you want. So what I've done is I've gone to the EPA website and I've just literally downloaded the zip files for 1999 uh, and 2012 for fine particulate matter data. It's sometimes called PM 2.5. All right, so let's take a look at the, just the, the basic data files that you get. So uh, in this directory here, uh, I've got the, uh, the, two, the two files for 1999 and 2012. Now, I should say that the, the original files are zip files, uh, and each of the zip files come with two things. One is a text file with this .txt uh, extension, and another is a PDF file which contains some documentation. So this is just the raw file that um, I downloaded from the EPA website. I haven't done anything to it. So we're, let's just take a look at a couple lines of, let's say, the 1999 file. All right, so I'm going to take a look at this. And so one thing you can see uh, is there, there's, it's a little bit messy here, but one thing that um, you can see, if I just pull this out a little bit, is that there's basically one record per line in this file. Uh, the first record here uh, is kind of a header, and it tells you the names, basically gives you the names of the different columns. You can see each column is separated by a little kind of vertical line here, so that's nice to see. Um, you can see that every record here begins with RD, all right? So these are called RD, that indicates kind of the type of record, and that corresponds to the heading in the RD here, a heading over here. Uh, there's another type of headings here that corresponds to RC records, which are, which are these guys over here. Um, and if there were any RC records in this file, then they would have those type, that heading. Uh, I don't believe that there are any RC uh, uh, records in this file, but we can just double check that by using a quick rep. So let's take a look at if any records start with RC. And, uh, and nope, and not for that one. And let's take a look at 2012. And none for that. So these are all RD records. And so we can take, we can use the RD headers to indicate well, what are the various columns, okay? And so a lot of these columns are not going to be particularly important to us, but one of the th some of the things we're going to want to know are, for example, what state the monitor uh, the the record comes from, uh, the county, the site ID indicates the kind of monitor within that county. 
Um, and then uh, most importantly is a sample value. So that tells us you know, what the level, that's the actual kind of mass of PM2.5 in micrograms per meter cubed. Um, so that's going to be very important. And because uh, we want to see if the le those levels have gone down over the, between 1999 and 2012. Uh, and the date of collection may also be important too. We'll see, we'll take a look a little bit at that later. Now there are a number of other things here that are indicating you know, certain records may have problems, um, but we're going to not worry about those at the moment. Uh, those kinds of things may come in, it may be important uh, later on in a, in a more in-depth analysis. Um, so um, let's start up R here. So, okay. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to read in the data for 1999. Um, and so um, I'm just going to call it PM0. Zero meaning kind of like the first one, and uh, the, you know I'll, I'll name the second one you know PM1 or something. So I'll just use a straight read table here. Um, and I'll give it the 1999 file. And uh, what I, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to ignore the lines um, that start with the hash symbol, and I'll figure I'll kind of pick those up later. Uh, I'll say header equals false, and then uh, sep equals. Remember, it's a uh, the solid line here, and then the missing values are indicated in this uh, file with just a blank string. All right, so I read those in. You can see. Um, that happens relatively quickly. Let's take a look. This is always good to you know, check to see you know how many dimensions you got. And so I've got about 117,000 rows, uh, 28 columns. Uh, let's take a look at the first few rows here, and you can see that um, uh, I don't have the headers for the columns, so I'll get those in a second. But you can see that there are all these are different columns. Um, and remember, the first column was this RD record indicator, um, and there are a lot of missing values here, um, which uh, are not that important right now. So one thing we're going to want to do is kind of get the column names for each of these uh, columns, so that we can get, we don't have to refer to them by you know V1, V2. So if you recall, the, the column names come from the very first line in the file. So I'm just going to read one line of the, the first line, so we can even use read lines for that. Uh, and I'm going to give it the file name. Uh, and it's going to tell it to read one line. Okay, so if I print out C names here, you can see first of all it's just a string, uh, and it hasn't been split across, you know, using the separator because I didn't use read dot table. I just read the line directly. So the first thing I'm going to have to do is split all the column, all the names out. Um, so I'm going to use stir split for that. I'm going to split on this solid line, and it's a fixed pattern, not a regular expression. So now if I print out C names, you can see I get a character vector containing uh, for each element it has the column name. Uh, now, now stir split actually returns a list back, and so you're just going to want the first element of this list. And so now I'm going to assign the column names to this uh, table to be this this uh, first value of this list here. So if I take a, now if I take a look at this data frame, you can see that um, there are all these all the column names are basically there. Now one of the things that you'll notice is that um, uh, the, this, these come, these column names are kind of not valid, so because they, they have spaces in them, for example. Um, and so, one thing you can do to fix that is to use the make dot names um, function. And that the make dot names basically takes an arbitrary string and makes and turns it into a valid name column name for a data frame. So now, if I take a look at um, the first few lines here, you can see that uh, it's replaced the spaces with dots. So now all of these are kind of valid column names for a data frame. So they'll be easier to reference uh, in future kind of modeling or analysis functions. Um, so the first thing I'm going to want to do is take out the PM2.5 uh, variable. So that's remember that's the sample value column right here. And you can see the first first three values here are missing, but then we've got 8.841, 14.9, etc. And those are in units of micrograms per meter cubed. So let's take a look at um, that column. Let's pull it out. Call it x0 here, um, and I'll just pull out the sample value column. Uh, and let's see what it is first. Uh, it's a numeric column. That's good. Should be numeric. Let's run a stir on it. Uh, okay, so we got 117,421 values. It's a numeric vector. Um, let's do a little summary to get a five number summary of this data. So you can see the median is 11.5 uh, micrograms per meter cubed. Um, the maximum goes up to 157, which is quite a high level uh, for a daily value. Uh, and there are also some missing values here. So let's see, and uh, so 13,000 missing values, let's see kind of roughly what that means in terms of the proportion. So we can see is.na on this. Um, and you can see that about 11% are missing. Um, so we so we come across an, uh, one interesting feature about this data set, which is that there are a number of missing values. Uh, and so one thing you have to ask yourself is, okay, are missing values something that I, that I need to worry about? 
um, for the question that I'm interested in answering. Remember, we want to we want to get a sense of you know, uh, is our in general is the whole country does the whole country have lower air pollution levels in, in 2012 than it did in 1999? So you, so um, the question is you know, there's an occasional missing value on a given day in a given county or monitor. Is that going to make a big difference? Uh, and in particular, is having 11% of your values missing going to make a big difference uh, in your analysis? So that's something to think about because missing values can play a very different role depending on what kind of question you're trying to answer. Uh, and so you have to, you don't always, although missing values can be very inconvenient uh, a lot of the times, they don't always cause a problem depending on what kind of question you're, depending on what type of question you're trying to answer. All right. So uh, now we've got the 1999 data. Let's read in the uh, 2012 data here. Uh, so I'll take, I'll call it PM1, I'll read.table it, uh, and, um, and we'll do the same kind of op, uh, st approach. I'll comment out this, these rows, header equals false, uh, sep equals the solid bar, uh, and then any, any strings like that, okay. So one thing you'll notice is that this is taking quite a bit longer than reading in the 1999 file. One of the um, one of the issues is that um, PM 2.5 monitoring only just began in 1999, so there were very few monitors at that time. Of course, over the years, uh, the monitoring has increased, and so now in 2012, there's a much bigger monitoring network uh, available, and so there are more going to be more observations. So let's take a look at how many observations exactly we have here. Um, uh, you see, it's quite a bit more. There's, there's one, about 1.3 million records here, uh, as opposed to the you know 117,000 records that we had before. So that may be a bit of a problem in and of itself, but we all kind of put that to the side for now. Uh, so uh, one thing I know is that the two files have the same column name. So you can see they both have 28 columns, and I know that the, the, the column names are going to be the same. They're both RD records. So I can just give the names for this data frame to be the same as the other one. So I'll do make dot names here again. Um, and you can see, um, if I take a look at the first few rows, oops, uh, all of the columns here. So you can see that um, the the dates are now 2012, and the sample values here are the PM 2.5 values. Um, so I'm going to grab the uh, PM 2.5 values from here and uh, take a quick check on what we have here. That's a numeric vector, numeric vector, 1.3 million elements, uh, so that looks good. Uh, so now let's, take a, let's do a quick comparison of the 2012 and the, and the 1999 data. So I'll do a summary on X1, um, and do a summary on X0. Um, so that's interesting. So you can see that in the, 19, in the 2012 data, the median is about 7.3. And in the 1999 data, the median is about 11.5. So there does appear on average to be a decrease um, in the levels for the whole country in PM 2.5. You notice that there are quite a few missing values in the um, 2012 data set. We can take a look at what proportion that is. Um, and oh, it's only see, it's only about five percent. So there's actually, as a percentage of the total, there's actually fewer missing values in 2012 than there were in 1999. So that's interesting to know. Five percent missing is probably not that big of a deal. Um, and so um, let's take a look at. So it's so on first glance, it appears that um, the um, the the PM 2.5 levels have gone down uh, over the years, and so that's a good that's good news for public health. Let's take a look. Let's see if we can take a look at a, box, a visual representation of this uh, data. So let's take a look at a box plot. Let's see, box plot x0, x1. Uh, and let me bring this up. So it's a little hard to look at. Um, there's a lot of skew in the PM2.5 data. And so there, uh, these are data are both, they're right skewed. And so you can see that um, it's kind of all smushed down near zero, but then there's some very large values. One thing you'll notice is that the maximum value here is 909, uh, which is an extremely high level. In fact, it's so high uh, for the United States that you, uh, we might uh, think that perhaps it's an error or something, maybe there's something wrong with it. 909 micrograms per meter cubed. Uh, although it's not impossible, we do observe it in other parts of the world. Uh, we generally don't observe it in the United States unless, for example, there's some special or strange occurrence. 
So maybe we'll think we'll think about that value a little bit later, because uh, uh, since we're not really focused on extremes right now, we're looking at kind of the the medians. Uh, so one way to, to kind of fix this box plot is to is to take the log of these guys. So let's take the log of x zero. I'll do the base ten log, and that will hopefully kind of even out the box plot a little bit. So here you can see that um, the uh, the the 1999 data is right here, so you can see the median is about a log of uh, equal to one, which is you know roughly 10 uh, micrograms per meter cube, and then you can see that the the black line, which is the median of this box plot, does go down quite a bit. Uh, remember, this is on a log scale, so even a small change can be a big uh, change in the absolute scale. Uh, but one thing you'll notice is that the spread of the data has also increased. Too. So even though the average levels have gone down, there are more kind of extreme values in the later data. Um, and so that's interesting. Uh, we're not exactly sure what to make of it. So the next thing we want to take a look at is if you notice in the summary for the 2012 data, uh, there's, uh, there's negative values here. So that's a little bit strange. So one of the things uh, about measuring PM2.5 is that we measure the mass of it uh, kind of per unit of airflow. So basically the idea is that there's a filter and there's air being sucked through the filter and then the particles collect on the filter and we weigh those filters to see how much, how many particles uh, kind of have landed on the filter. And so because of the way that it's measured, it's, you really can't have a negative measure, you can't have negative mass. Um, and so if there's a negative value for the PM2.5 variable, that's a little strange, it's a little unusual. Um, so let's take a look, we can take a look at that. Um, and see, kind of maybe get a sense of what's going on. So let's let's pluck out the values. Let's take a look one more time at the summary. Um, let's take let's pluck out the values that happen to be negative. So I'll create a logical vector uh, that is true or false depending on you know whether the the 2012 PM 2.5 value is below zero. So if you take a stir on this, uh, you'll see that is this true false vector. Um, so if I take the sum of this, uh, any RM equals true. Uh, you'll see that there are about 26,000 values um, that are below zero or negative. So that's a little bit strange. Uh, let's, let's see what the proportion this is. So it's about 2% of the values. This is not a really large number of values. Um, and so maybe it's something that we don't even care about, but, uh, but it may be worth taking a look at it. So in particular, it may be interesting to see whether there are negative values at certain times of the year, or maybe the, only the negative values occur at certain uh, locations or times. So let's take a look at the dates of the measurements. So I'll pull up the dates um, column. And if you take a look at this, first of all, you'll notice that it is an integer vector, right? So these are coded as integers by default, um, uh, which is uh, not gonna be as useful for us. So we wanna be able to convert them into dates. Um, and so one thing you'll notice is that they're in a year. So the first four digits of the year, the second is the month and the second is the day, right? So here we've got 2012 and then January and then 28th, right? So let's take a look, let's convert those guys to um, date uh, variables. So we do as.date, uh, and, um, and it's gonna be in the year, month, day format. Okay. Now it's a re reasonably long vector, so it's gonna take probably a few seconds on a reasonable computer. Now take a look at the dates vector. So you can see now it's in the date format. Um, so let's take a look at um, just a histogram of the dates to see kind of where the collection occurs. Uh, we can do it by month. Uh, and you see that um, the, uh, most of the, most of the, 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 high, the measurements are occurring in kind of the, um, um, in the winter months here. So winter and spring months here. Um, so let's see what, what where the negative values tend to be. So we'll do hist on dates and negative. So this only makes a histogram of the dates where the negative values occur. Oops, and I'll say month. And you can see that the uh, the negative values tend to occur uh, seem to occur more often in the um, in the late in the um, in the December, January, February types of months. Uh, there's, some, there's a little bit of a spike here uh, in April, in kind of May, June type period. So um, it's interesting to see that there aren't many negative values here uh, in the summer months here. Um, and so it, it's not entirely clear what, you know, what this tells us, uh, but it may be worth investigating. One, one issue with PM 2.5 is that in many areas of the country, it tends to be very low in the winter. 
um, and high in the summer. And so typically when, when, uh, when pollution values are high, they're easier to measure. And when they're low, they're harder to measure. So maybe the, some of the negative values are just kind of a measurement error when the values tend to be very low. Um, so, uh, but given that it's only 2% of the data, I'm not going to spend too much time worrying about it at the moment. Um, it may be something that we worry about later. So one of the things that I think would be interesting to do is, you know, rather than look at the, the air pollution levels for the entire country and say, okay, well, the median for the entire country has gone down between 1999 and 2012. Why don't we pick out one monitor and see whether the level, we can see the a kind of a, de a change or a decrease in the levels just at that one location. And so, um, and uh, that way we can kind of control for the fact that, you know, there's different monitors at different times. Uh, now, one thing we have to do is we have to find a monitor that, kind of, that was kind of out there in 1999 and then it was also out there in 2012 uh, it's because, the, you know, the networks changed quite a bit. And so look, we're going to pick a state uh, and then try to find a monitor in that state to see whether or not, you know, the pollution levels have gone down. So I'm just going to pick New York State because that's where I'm from. And let's try to take a little, let's just try to find a monitor there that we can, where we can look at the change in the levels. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to subset um, the um, PM data to look at the um, all of the kind of monitors in, in, in New York State. So I'm going to take, um, oops. so I'm take the PM0 um, data frame and I'm going to subset on state code equals 36, which I just happen to know is New York State because I do this a lot. And I'm going to pluck out the county code and the site ID uh, columns. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the uh, 2012 data set here. Okay, so, um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, so if you take a look at site zero, you can see it's a, it's a two column data frame um, and it just has the, the county code and the site ID. What I'm going to do is create a special kind of variable that's based, that's just the county code and the site ID pasted together, right? And so we can literally use the uh, paste function to do that. So I'm going to kind of replace this guy with paste um, and I'll take the first column and the uh, second column and separate it with a period. And then I'm gonna do the same thing for the uh, 2012 data, all right? So now if you take a look at site zero, it's a character vector, you can see that the it's the kind of county dot and then the site ID. Uh, if you look at this, it's kind of the same thing, all right? So one thing you'll notice is that um, the, the, the 2012 vector, it only has 18 elements. Uh, so there are only 18 uh, county and site ID combinations, whereas this two, the, the 1999 data had 33 of those combinations. So the only thing, that, so basically what we want to do is we want to see, well, where, what is the intersection between these two guys? So where, you know, wh which, which county slash monitor ID numbers exist in both sets? So we can just use the intersect functions for that. And I'll assign it to an object called both. So these are the monitors that are in both the 1999 and 2012 data sets. So if we print this out, you can see that there are there are 10 monitors, uh, 10 county slash monitors that are um, in both data sets. So that's good, at least that there are a few that we can look at across the time period. Um, now, one of the, th one of the things that uh, would be useful is if we chose the monitor that is an a, first of all in both time periods, but also had a lot of observations that we could look at. So let's take a look at how many observations are in each of these monitors in each of these time periods. Okay, so um, so the first thing we want to do is we want to count, we want to figure out how many observations are available at each monitor. So I'm going to create a new variable called county dot site, uh, which is just um, the what we just created. So it's it's the uh, county code pasted with the site ID, but I'm putting this in the original data frame here, and I'm going to do it for the 2012 also. Um, and then I want, what I want to do is I want to subset this data frame to be just New York State, right? So I'm going to subset PM0 to be state code 36 and uh, county site is also is one of these special monitors which is in both um, in both data sets. All right, do that for this guy here. And now what I'm going to so if you take a look at this, uh, it's the same data frame, but it's only the rows that are in New York City. So you can see that the state code here now is 36, right? So um, so what I want to do is I want to split this data frame. 
uh, by the kind of monitor. So I want to split it into separate data frames by each monitor and then count how many observations there are in each of them. So I'm going to do a split uh, this data frame by the this county site variable. Right, um, and uh, now actually that was not particularly useful because it just spit out a whole list of data frames and I don't really know what happened there. So what I want to do is I want to S-apply over all these data frames and count the number of rows that there are. Okay, so that gives me the number of observations uh, that are in each of these data frames. So you can see that, for example, county one, site 12 had 61 observations and county one, site five had 122. Um, so now I want to do the same thing for the later period. Um, excuse me. I did change this too. Uh, and you can see now that for there are, in County 1, Site 12 only had 31 observations uh, in 2012 rather than 61, oops, uh, 61 in the uh, 1999 data set. Um, so I think that the county that I'm going to, the county slash monitor that I'm going to pick here is going to be County 63 uh, and monitor 2008. So let's take a look at those guys um, and see what we can look at in terms of PM trends. Um, so I'm going to call a new data frame called PM1 sub, um, and I'll subset it, PM1. Uh, county code is uh, 63, and the site ID is 2008. All right. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the 1999 data. I know that they're both there. I look at PM1, I know there's 30 observations. And for PM0 sub, there should be 122. There you go. So, so the thing we're going to do now is we're going to take each of these data frames, and we're just going to plot the data, the PM2.5 data, as a function of time. So there's going to be like a little time series here. And on the x-axis is going to be the date. And on the y-axis is going to be the level of PM2.5. And we just want to get a t t to visualize whether or not we can see that the levels of PM2.5 have gone down over this kind of 13-year uh, period um, at this particular monitor, okay? So we're gonna make some plots to do that. Um, so the first thing we need to do um, is to get the dates out uh, so we can plot the, the data as a function of date. Um, so dates, I'll create a dates vector here from this PM sub vec um, data frame um, and um, get the PM 2.5 data out. Um, and um, so if I make a plot of the dates, you can see, um, uh, well, first thing you'll notice is that the dates are not coded properly. They're integers here. Uh, and so we need to convert them into dates. So I'm going to do that right now. And they're in year, month, day format. So now if I make this plot again, uh, well, first of all, you can take a look at the new variable. Uh, if I make this plot, so it's in date format now. And you can see now the plot makes more sense. The x-axis is coded appropriately. And you can see that the uh, the data are kind of bouncing around all over the place, somewhere between 4 and 14 micrograms per meter cubed. So this is the 2012 data. So let's do the same thing for, um, 2000, for 1999. Uh, we'll convert these guys to date format since we know we have to do that. Uh, and let's make a little plot here. Oops, I didn't get the PM2.5 data. All right, so let's make a plot of the 1999 data. Um, so you can see that again, first of all, you'll notice that uh, the data are only actually recorded starting in July uh, through the end of the year. So only about a half of the year of the data is collected there. Um, and so, and you can see that they range from roughly, say, five micrograms per meter cube to about 40. Um, so, now of course, it's a little hard to look at them, the plots separately, so why don't we make a plot um, that kind of puts both, both 1999 and 2012 on the same panel. So, uh, so we need to use par for that, and we'll say MF row is, is one, two. So this says one row, two columns. And I'm going to adjust the margins a little bit to create more space. So uh, first I'll plot the 1999 data on the, on the left-hand side here. 
I'll change the plotting character for fun. All right, and then I'll plot the, uh, I'm gonna put a little line here uh, at the median for that year. Okay, so that gives me the median, about a, maybe a 10 point so uh, micrograms per meter cubed. Now let's plot the uh, 2012 data. And we'll plot the median. All right, all right so that's, uh, well, that's a little bit unusual. It looks like the values are going up uh, between the two years. But actually, uh, so it's a little bit misleading because you'll notice that the y-axis for the 2012 data uh, is totally different from the y-axis for the 1999 data. And so even though it looks like it's going up between the two uh, time periods, um, uh, it probably actually is going, to, if you look at the median here, it's a little over 10, and the median here is a little bit, is quite a bit under 10, actually. And so um, this picture is by itself is a little bit misleading. Uh, so we need, what we need to do is we need to put the two plots on the same range. Um, so let's do that by calcul calculating the range um, of the data set uh, with, the, uh, with the range function, right? So let's take a look at um, the range of x0 sub um, and x1 sub together and we'll remove the missing values. You can see that um, it's uh, between three and 40 micrograms per meter cube. So let's assign that to this, uh, to a variable called RNG. And now we need to re remake the plots um, to be, um, to, to kind of fix the range here. So um, I'll set par um, just in case. I'll, I don't need to do this actually. Uh, so let's plot the dates. Um, and PCH equals 20, but now I'm gonna set Y lim to be equal to this range, okay? And I'll uh, set the AB line, H equals median. All right, and then I'm gonna do the same thing, but for the 2012 data. And remember, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep the range here to be the same. Um, and, uh, and I'll set the uh, little horizontal line here. Uh, and now you can see it makes more sense, right? So uh, you can see that the horizontal line, the median is going down between the two years at this monitor. And more interestingly actually for me is the fact that you can see there's a huge spread of points here in the 1999 data and there's a relatively modest spread of points for the 2012 data. So what this, so what this means actually is quite interesting is that not only are the average levels going down, but these extreme values are also coming down across the years too. So not so we so on average we're we're kind of breathing in lower levels of pollution, but we don't get these huge spikes uh, on a daily basis like we used to get in 1999. So that those two kind of facts are quite interesting because they uh, they they kind of address two different types of problems. One is more of a chronic problem of having kind of just on average very high air pollution levels, and one is more of an acute problem where you get these really big spikes. Um, that can cause uh, different types of health problems. And so we've reduced the average levels and the spikes uh, at this monitor, so that's quite interesting. Um, so one thing I think, so the last thing I think I wanna look at is, is to say, okay, well, not, let's not look at the whole country, uh, but also it's not that useful perhaps to look at just one monitor. And so why don't we look at uh, individual states in the country? So we'll look at the different states to see how the individual states have improved or not uh, across the years. Uh, and one of the reasons why this is important is because the states are actually where a lot of the implementation of the regulations occur. So when the EPA sets the national guidelines for air pollution levels, it's up to the state to figure out how it's going to kind of come into compliance with those guidelines. And so it'd be useful to kind of, kind of develop a summary at the state level um, to kind of see what's going on at, at this kind of very important level. And furthermore, the state is somewhere, is somewhere in between, you know, the whole country and an individual monitor, okay? So what, what I wanna do is I wanna create a plot that has kind of the value, the state averages for 1999, and then the state averages for 2012. And then I just wanna connect the dots to see, connect each state to see whether it's going up or it's going down or maybe staying the same. So that's the kind of plot I wanna make. So, um, Let's, uh, let's figure this out. So I'll change my plot window here, bring it back. So uh, first thing we're gonna, let's take a look. Remember the, um, the, um, the data has a, has a column here, which is the state code. And so there, every, every state will have a code there. Um, and so what I wanna do is I wanna take the sample value here. So this is the PM 2.5 value. And then I wanna basically, I just wanna take the average value 
by state, right? So this is the kind of thing that's going to require the t-apply function, where the t-apply member takes the mean uh, of, a, of a vector within subgroups determined by another vector, right? And so um, this is the perfect job for t-apply. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I'm going to create a vector that I'll call mean zero. So this is the mean of the 1999 data. And I'm going to base it on the PM2 point, PM0 data frame. And I'm going to t-apply the sample value uh, based on the state and within subsets of the state code. Um, and I want to use the mean function. And uh, I'm going to get rid of missing values here. Okay. So if I take a look at this guy now, you can see that there are, uh, there are 53 elements here. And um, these are the means of the individual states. Okay. Uh, if I take a summary, uh, you can see that they range from 4.8 micrograms per meter cube to 19.96. Okay, so now we need to do the same thing for the 2012 data. So I'll just uh, let me just go up here and I'll just change this to a one. It's the same operation. Uh, we can take a summary of this data. Uh, you can see that um, it ranges from about four to 11. Okay, so and the median is definitely lower. The median in 1999 was 12, and then this is the state. Average this is kind of the median of all the states, and the median of all the states in 2012 was 8.7. Um, so um, now that I want to create a data frame for each of these guys um, that has the kind of the name of the state and the um, and the or the ID of the state and their and their kind of average PM 2.5. So I'm going to create a data frame called D0 um, with a variable called state. It's going to be equal to the names of this guy and then mean, which is which is the value. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the later data. So you can look at D0. You can see that there's the state and then the mean. We look at D1. It's also the state and the mean. And now I just want to merge these guys together. So I can use the merge function on D0, D1. And I'm going to merge it on the um, state name. Oops. It's a little typo there. So if you look at the uh, merged values, there are, you can see there are 52 rows. Um, and if you look at the merge, you now you can see that the mean, mean X, so this corresponds to the 1999 value, and this corresponds to the 2012 value. So now I've got a data frame which, is, which has uh, the state code, it has one row per state, and then each row there ha there's the, the kind of the state average for 1999 and the state average for um, 2012. So just basically what I want to do is create a plot that plots those state averages and then connects kind of connects them with a line. So that's the last thing I'm going to do here. Um, so I'm going to reset my par to be to just one plot here instead of a panel plot. Um, and then with this merged data frame, I'm going to plot. Uh, I know that there are 52 values, so I'm just going to plot the 1999 um, values um, on in one column. That's, that's, uh, and, I'm, and the, um, all right. And I want to set the uh, X limb here. So I want to make room, because I know I'm going to plot the 2012 values later. So I want to set the X limb to say, let's be, um, and then, um, like that. Oops. And uh, all right, so you can see I've got my 1999 values right here. And then I'm going to do the same thing, but instead of plotting, I'm going to use points um, to add the points for 2012. And this is the third column of the data frame. And I don't need this excellent here because I'm using points. Um, and if I bring the plot over here, you can see that I've got my plot. So oh, you can see that the, the data has kind of gone down quite a bit. Uh, we saw this already in, in the individual monitor data. So all we need to do now is kind of connect the dots here. And so we can use the segments function for that. Uh, and so we give the x coordinates, uh, the y coordinates, and then the, the second set of x coordinates, which would be 2012. And uh, Eric, now we can see, ah, okay, so this is quite interesting. Um, now we can see that most of the states have gone down. You can see this line here has gone down. Um, these lines here, are all, some, some states have gone up. 
Um, and uh, but the vast majority of these states appear to be going down. The one thing you'll notice is that there appear to be some lines kind of going off the chart here. Uh, that's because I didn't set the Y limb to be equal to the full range of the data set. Um, so we could have fixed that, uh, but I won't bother with it right now. We can fix it later. But now we can see that each of the states, how, kind of how, how, how they progressed over the many years here. So some states kind of have barely really moved at all. So this state right here has barely really moved at all. Uh, and the lines kind of connecting the dots help us see what the trends are at the individual state level. All right, so that's basically, that's kind of a first exploratory analysis of some air pollution data in the United States. Uh, if you were just to summarize, the, the, the basic question we were trying to answer was, you know, have particulate matter levels uh, decreased between 1999 and 2012? And we looked at it for the whole country uh, between 1999 and 2012. We looked at it for an individual monitor between those two time periods, and we looked at it for individual states. And so through a, a combination of kind of summaries, five number summaries, box plots, uh, scatter plots, things like that, uh, we can get a very nice look at the data and, and get a sense of kind of what kinds of questions we can at, continue to ask and what kinds of things we, sh we should follow up on. Um, so that's just a, that's a base, a, a kind of a, a simple case study of how, of how to do exploratory analysis, and I hope you find it helpful.